Welcome to the second session of uh, FE Voices in this series. Last week, we uh, showcased what MK College Group was doing from a strategic point of view, looking at um, what uh, we are doing to drive forward the agenda of equality, diversity and inclusion. And this week, we've got um, another showcase piece, which is from Birmingham Metropolitan College Group. And um, we've got Sam Coles, who will be joined by Sue Hopewell, and her colleague Shimimara Begum, and I'll introduce those later after their presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to now present the presentation from BMET and what we are going to look at, their particular approach where they're looking at how they've embedded um, the practices throughout the college and um, it's an interesting take because one of the showcases that they're going to look at is through uh, the lens of how they've embedded the LGBTQ uh, work that they're doing um, as a, a usualized approach. And I've I tweeted that online and I've also um, discussed that regarding uh, on, on LinkedIn. But it's it's, it's, a, it's a good approach. It's a, it's a different approach in terms of how do we, instead of normalizing, which it, what is normal, but how do we usualize um, various aspects of equality, diversity and inclusion work in everyday practice? And um, as I said, I'm going to share with you their presentation. Here it goes. Hello, welcome to Birmingham Met College's presentation. We are taking you on a tour of the work around equality, diversity and inclusion at BMET, offering up what I think is an honest appraisal of our barriers and challenges to inclusion, our approach, our aims and aspirations, and some successes. Um, my name's Sam Coles. I work at the college as the diversity and inclusion manager. Um, and I just want to speak to the lift picture here, which um, very much reminds me of the occasion when I found myself in the lift at Matthew Bolton College, one of our city centre campuses. Um, and I was in the lift with the leading Ofsted inspector and he was on his way out of the building after a very hard week. And he said, do you know what? We should be very, very proud of the work that we have done around diversity and inclusion. And that was acknowledged in our inspection report in 2018, uh, where um, amongst other things, they said that leaders and managers ensure that diversity and inclusion are, are at the heart of the college. Hello everybody, um, my name is Sue Hopewell, I'm the Vice Principal for Curriculum Quality and I'm pleased to be here. Hi, I'm Shami Myra Begum and I'm a Learning Technologies Coach here at BMET College. So first a bit about us. We are a large further education college in Birmingham. We have approximately 800 members of staff and around 10,000 students made up of apprentices as well as those studying further education and higher education. We have three large campuses as well as additional satellite sites and each of the sites have their own idiosyncrasies and lots of different curriculum provisions such as construction, engineering, horticulture, early years, health and social care, computing, creative services, dentistry and ESOL amongst a few. Our college operates in some of the most socially and economically deprived areas in the country. We do have a fairly even gender split. And in terms of ethnic diversity, we have a majority minority base with 66% black, Asian and minority ethnic students. Of those black, Asian and minority ethnic students, Pakistani learners are consistently the single largest group of the overall student population, followed by African students as well as Caribbean students. So I guess we should talk about our barriers and challenges first. Actually, let's look at some of the issues we've identified, which I think many colleges might relate to. We had a particular challenge of a tick box or superficial approach around DNI and the perception that it was just another thing to do. So how could we move away from this and move towards the meaningful integration of EDI in every aspect of college life? In creating truly inclusive environments, and in creating real cultural intelligence and nurturing deeper cultural understanding, which could then be evidenced in staff and student experiences and in staff and also student outcomes. Fundamentally achieving equality of outcome. 
We celebrate our areas of outstanding practice. However, we do have areas that require improvement and therefore inconsistency is one of the challenges that we face. We knew that there was a them and us approach around many aspects, the managers, those managers, those staff at the other side, the other team, it's not my job, and that needed really addressing, and a culture of low aspiration, not just for our students, but also for our staff. So what were the barriers to us addressing some of these things? We really needed to have a good look in the mirror here, and, and we kept coming back time and time again to um, staff engagement. How could we get everyone on board? How could we also really engage the quietest voices to truly um, garner that, that diversity of perspective? Um, staff understanding really was a potential barrier. So um, that, that, that's a bit of a value piece really. Um, so really enhancing understanding around why EDI is absolutely critical to any organisation and indeed beyond. And then actually, what what does that look like? What what does it feel like? Um, and the and and that relates very much to staff confidence. Um, so getting staff to know um, what it means to them in their practice and how they can be more inclusive um, in their in their everyday. Um, and can't not mention um, resource being a barrier because um, if you're a college in, in a further education sector, everyone can relate to that. And, you know, there's never enough time. And it felt essential that hours um, were protected for staff to engage in staff development activities. Having said all that, that you know, um, what was in our gift? Hand over to Sue. So in our gift was an executive and senior leadership team and board of governors who wanted to do the right thing and a commitment of budget to support the designated role to influence the direction, which is Sam's role, and work around those values and the staff and student behaviours as part of a culture change programme. A great example of this is the development that we did around our ready, respectful and safe values and principles, which underpin everything we do and apply to staff and students. We invested in both time, effort and money to roll out the programme and continue to make sure all our staff are confident with this approach. ROS, as we call it, encapsulates our approach around expectations for staff and students to nurture in a positive behaviour through modelling and also challenging. This saw the development of a positive behaviour policy most recently um, and in which we, we uh, actually included trauma-informed practice which helps staff understand the drivers for behaviour that falls below expectations, takes a more empathetic approach uh, to supporting those students. Our meet and greet is a lovely activity that sets a scene for Ready, Respectful, Save. We welcome our students onto the, the colleges every single day and, and we encourage them to have a good day. Identifying the, the issues, the challenges and barriers, what, what did we then do? Um, you know, we took a really um, methodical approach here. Uh, we took uh, a, a comprehensive review in 2018, which included consultation exercises with staff and students and governors, and that really shaped our um, our DNI strategy going forward. Um, and I do want to know that you know, this isn't to say that the work that there hadn't been work done before then, of course there had, and there was some really good stuff, but as Sue was speaking to, you know, it felt arbitrary um, and, and inconsistent. So our new strategy gave us a, a very specific objectives, targets and actions to meet our objectives, uh, which all the activities hang off. And some of this, you know, was, was about a, a really uh, getting the fundamental conditions right. And that, you know, it, it includes ensuring staff are paid the real living wage, it ensures that our physical and our, our, our virtual environments are accessible for our disabled stakeholders. Um, and then, you know, really unusually, we made the decision not to have uh, an EGI committee or, or a steering group to avoid the position that DNI was down to, to just that one committee. And of course, you know, this is about all of us, it's about every one of us. And um, our strategic objectives are therefore led by our senior leadership team. They're enacted through um, their direct reports and fed through to department and team objectives. And this year, every individual's performance development objectives. Uh, this along with our staff networks 
and our diversity inclusion staff and student ambassadors are really helping to build um, that organisational capacity around EDI. There's an individual responsibility here and an accountability through those PDRs and um, our key KPIs and um, management reports uh, which go to governors all demonstrate the progress. This is of course also about our external stakeholders and um, we've ensured that our partners and contractors and employers that we work with are also aligned to our work and support our work um, in everything they do. We then formalised some key principles in our next four year strategy and that included things like actively encouraging diversity and different perspectives, improving the representation of our community at all levels of the college. An example here is of improving representation within the workforce and that actually started with BMET's Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Supported Leadership Programme and more recently our work that has commenced with the Black Further Education Leadership Group to become an anti-racist college and working towards meeting the aspects of their 10 point plan which covers things like climate, curriculum communications and culture. We know that representation really matters. We've heard this from the Student Commission of Racial Justice, which our students participated in, and we've seen some great outcomes when we get it right. A department in our college, which has a wholly black, Asian and minority ethnic staff working within a college where the students are largely black, Asian and of minority ethnicities. They achieved outcomes for 16 to 18 year olds of 97%. Another one of our underpinning principles is achieving a quality of outcome as well as a quality of opportunity. We are proud of how we are narrowing or have closed the gap between different groups and have done this through concerted work to ensure that we have sight of high priority students where we look at data and triangulate analysis from student voice, surveys, outcomes, destinations and other reports. And this ensures that we can then apply early interventions and support those students throughout their journey with the college. We've done work on starting points, we've enhanced tutorials and we've also done a lot of work around it, raising aspirations. And this, is, this has helped us to, to close gaps with our high need students um, and narrow the gaps uh, between our ethnic minority students. Another one of our principles in our uh, diversity and inclusion strategy is about adopting a usualising approach to integrating diversity and inclusion, ensuring different identities, especially hidden and absent identities, are included in the everyday. We're using this approach in teaching and learning and assessment, and particularly around LGBTQI um, plus identities. Um, and here, usualising really is about um, just referencing or including or presenting something with very little or no fuss. And we'll see an example of that a bit later. Another principle and something we really felt strongly about was going beyond the five F's, which are food, fashion, famous people, flags and festivals, with celebratory events and activities to develop deeper cultural understanding and avoiding the exotification of groups and cultures, which can perpetuate harmful stereotypes. I mean, this isn't to say that some of those things don't matter. Of course, we care about food, festivals, etc. And they are great enticers to engage people. But here it's about extending that understanding. And some great examples are of a live storytelling session to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the independence of Bangladesh. And the session covered and shared information about the history, issues of identity, as well as some of the conflict that still exists today. This really nicely links in with another one of our principles, which is about overcoming the challenges of balancing the needs of diverse people and groups and work to strengthen the commonalities that we share. Our Black History activities extend beyond Caribbean food and African drumming to explore the diverse lived experiences of Black staff and students. Take a look at our video, Proud to be Black, which was created during Black History Month this year. Oh, 
I'm still able to do what other people do. And that's why I'm proud to be black because I can do better. I can try harder and work time, 10 times as hard. I'm proud to be black because of the people that inspire me, like Oprah Winfrey, Maya Angelou, Nelson Mandela, these people that had a real disadvantage in this life and they proved, they proved a lot of people wrong. So I believe that if they can do it, so can I. We are strong, we are, I see it all around me. I'm a descendant of strong black women. I work around strong black women and men and I'm really proud of our black students. So I am very proud of my heritage and I'm always humbled by the contributions of black people, particularly those who work tirelessly within their communities and are great role models for our students. Another one of our guiding principles is about offering a fair wage and employment terms and conditions. Um, and I've said this already, you know, this is about recognising that these are fundamental to social and economic inclusion. It's as much about getting the fundamental conditions right, where diversity is sought and nurtured to create inclusion and belonging. Our d &I work has subsequently rolled into a, a, a raft of wellbeing engagement work for staff and students and we're seeing some um, really positive outcomes as a result of that. It goes without saying that we aim to employ the social model of inclusion of disability and work to remove barriers that allow for full participation and success. This has included work around physical and virtual accessibility and inclusion of neurodiverse students and staff. Recently, there was a launch of a reasonable adjustment policies, which was around a, a passport for staff. Um, our final um, underpinning principle is, is around treating uh, disability as standard rather than exception. So really rewarding genuine achievement for our disabled students and staff, moving away from, from what can be seen as a patronising approach. And really this speaks to, to about raising the aspirations of, of all of our staff and all of our students. I think probably the work we've done around LGBTQ plus inclusion is a good example of our approach. And we've been delighted to be awarded the Gold Pride in Inclusion Award with Educate and Celebrate in recognition of the significant progress that we've made around sexual orientation and gender diversity and inclusion. So to really give you an example of, of everything we've been speaking about, um, you know, the work that we've done around LGBTQ plus inclusion is very much part of our culture change program. It's very much part of our work around organisational health, DNI, and wellbeing engagement. We have strategised our objectives um, around LGBTQ plus inclusion and actions relating to those objectives uh, are led from the top. They're enacted through senior leadership and their direct reports to really ensure we got that cross college ownership. In the early days, we use and actually continue to use equality analyses, those impact assessments to ensure that gender and sexual orientation diversity is considered in any policy plan or practice. And early on, we, we move to ensure we're using gender inclusive language in, in all that um, documentation and actually in practice. That's a work in progress. Um, and we and totally important, um, you know, at the beginning was that that we that we had clear sight of the student and staff community. So we introduced the sexual orientation, gender identity questions on our equality monitoring forms, which is really allowing us to build a picture of um, LGBTQ plus student and staff engagement, achievement and satisfaction. For our professional development, we have an expectation that all our staff training and LGBTQ plus um, includes the BMET bespoke online modules that we've got. We have new staff induction that sets the scene. Our LGBTQ plus inclusion integrated in cross college training, uh, for example, including unconscious bias, diversity and inclusion, racial equality, uh, to really take an intersectional approach. Um, and this is part of also building an inclusive curriculum, which is a series that we've been running. We're getting much better at taking an intersectional approach and have offered up sessions, for example, on black contributions to LGBTQ+, uh, rights, rights Movement for Black History Month, and the LGBTQ and the Southern Asian community. More recently, taking a conversational approach to further developing the DNI skills and confidence of staff using panel events, and we, we've entitled these Let's Talk, where we, we undertake storytelling sessions to build empathy and understanding of what can be, uh, you know, some of those more tricky subjects, really. 
these have been highly successful. We are lucky enough to have a team who lead on student enrichment and student voice events throughout the year, engaging students in events and activities. The best are those organised by the students themselves or even the curriculum areas. For example, our student LGBTQ plus network, who linked in with the students at Birmingham University and took part in a city pride walk, as well as drama students performing Everybody's Talking About Jamie. We have a staff LGBTQ plus network and college closure meant that the three college student networks formed a larger BMET group and this allowed us to build on a network of allies. And for several years, we have been running an LGBTQ plus panel event with live question and answers from a large student audience. We've been building on our physical and virtual environments to create a safe visibility for LGBTQ plus people and signalling to all that we welcome all people of diverse sexual orientation and gender. Poster campaigns, flying the flag, messages of inclusion slowly move into some gender inclusive facilities. Our virtual environments have become even more important over the last 18 months from entire college closure and now a hybrid way of working for many of our staff. Explicit commitment on website Yammer and SharePoint are used to promote LGBTQ plus diversity. Awareness events and campaigns with supporting resources in a DNI toolkit and a wellbeing hub. And we, we try to ensure that our LGBTQ plus identities are included in all themed posters. For example, within International Women's Month, Black History Month, Mental Health Awareness, taking time to focus on bisexuality and other sexual orientations. We have seen some great examples of LGBTQ plus inclusion in, in the curriculum um, in some project work. So you can see an example here of one of our level three students, Adam Araki's work. Um, and in many curriculum areas, we've got some great examples where uh, LGBT inclusion is planned for or actually where those naturally uh, occurring opportunities um, are seen and, you know, easier in some of the ologies in health and social care in early years in English. Um, and of course, you know, we recognise that more um, perceived challenges actually in some some other subjects, so rail engineering, bricklaying or maths. Um, and this is where, you know, that usualising methodology that we mentioned really comes in. Um, and you can see an example on the screen here with maths. So as part of the presentation, um, we were asked to consider any uh, unintended outcomes um, from the work that we've been doing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say that, crikey, we, we've had um, some tears, <laughs> we've had a fair bit of pain, but we've had real fun and we've seen rewards in some of the risks that we've taken. Um, we think I think we've got, you know, greater connectivity uh, amongst colleagues, uh, much more collaborative way of working. Um, I think, you know, we've really learned from each other. I think we're getting a sense of, um, you know, a real uh, increase in empathy and overall increased sense of well-being and engagement. Look, I've put this last uh, slide up because I, I, I love this. Of course, we know uh, what diversity and inclusion is, is about, inclusion being asked, uh, asked to that dance. But, you know, belonging, oh, this says it all for me. Belonging is about dancing like no one is watching. Welcome back. As you'll agree, a brilliant presentation, uh, really insightful, really exciting work. And, and such, I think what I got from it was is that it was such a positive approach in terms of how people are engaging with it. And, and also, I think the outcome seemed to embolden even more activity to, to happen within the, within the college environment and in terms of all the different aspects. I'd like to welcome to the e-stage, Sam Coles and Sue Hopewell. And I've also got in the background there, uh, Shamima Ara, uh, she, I know that she, oh, she stopped driving now, which is good. She was driving <laughs> when this first started. So I'm glad that that's nice and safe that you're now out of the car. Um, over to you, Sam, if you just want to do a quick intro in terms of who you are and what um, what you do at BMET. Yeah, thank you so much, Of I hope um, everyone 
can appreciate how painful it is watching a video <laughs> of yourself. So Sue and I have been using the opportunity to have a little bit of a chat. Anyway, thanks for joining us and, and listening um, to our presentation. So my name's Sam Coles. As you've already gathered, I've worked uh, as an equality, diversity and inclusion practitioner for oh nine, nearly 10 years now. Um, and I have been with Birmingham Met College for four years and wow what can I say it's uh, we're on a journey which feels like we're never truly going to arrive at the destination but I, I, I think that's kind of a good thing because this is an ever changing landscape isn't it so that's all I'm going to say for now I'm going to hand over to one of my colleagues Good evening, everybody. Really pleased to be here. Uh, my name's Sue Hopewell. I'm the Vice Principal for Curriculum and Quality at BMET. Um, I joined the college two years ago, but actually originally started in FE as, as a teacher uh, about 25 years ago in Leicester, at Leicester College. And, and it soon actually made me realise and open my eyes, um, you know, just really what equality and diversity meant to me, actually, you know, the number of students that, that I was really involved with in supporting them, uh, you know, as asylum seekers, new to the college, uh, young people that, that had been married at a young age and that sort of thing, really opened my eyes very quickly. And, and so this is a subject that is very close to my heart. So so I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you. And welcome, Sue. And over to you, Shamim Arara. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Yes, I'm Shami Mara and um, I'm a learning technologies coach um, at BMET. But pre pre prior to that, I was I was in curriculum. I used to teach health and social care. And I think one of the things that opened my eyes is that I found myself teaching in a college where I was uh, one of a handful of non-white people and that staff and students. So and I, and I grew up in a, in a very majority Asian part of Birmingham. So I was sort of on the other side and, you know, all of a sudden I, I became an ethnic minority when I was never, ever used to that. I'd always been part of an ethnic majority um, throughout school and even university. So that, that really opened my eyes to, to a whole bunch of new things. And here at BMA, I'm also blessed to be able to be a diversity and inclusion ambassador. Thank you. Uh, a wide range of experiences um, on the panel today. So I think I'm going to jump straight in, if that's OK, while we wait for people to think about what questions they want to ask. Now, as I said, there's a lot of positivity in terms of your approaches. And I think I think you really wanted to focus in on that, which is good, which is how we keep ourselves going. But what sort of barriers did you come across? So you've been there four years, Sam. Uh, what barriers did you come across? Whether you've overcome them or not is a different thing, but which barriers did you initially come across when you started having these conversations within the college? Wow, so um, where to start? I think the presentation said it. I mean, it, it generally it's been around um, the resource of time, actually, not necessarily mm. money here. So um, being time poor, as we know, is a feature of, of, of the FE world, um, which then did not enable kind of the work that needed to happen around building staff confidence that, and the DNI skills actually that 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 we needed to um, to nurture. I think it was um, was it Jeff who said this or uh, our colleague Issa who said um, you know building cultural intelligence here is is key to this work and actually mm. it was around kind of carving time for that so almost making some of the initially the training we made it kind of mandatory to begin with so we'd always had like an online mandatory generic edi training but we started to do kind of face-to-face -face training around you know unconscious bias and being disability confident and we've moved on from that to, 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 to take a much more conversational approach so i think yeah barriers was around our time but also, yes, yeah, start staff feeling um, it's that attitudinal piece really mm. about staff feeling uh, being resistant actually to 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 change, mm. um, and we're seeing that with um, some of our work that we're doing, lovely piece of work with our anti-racism work. You know, we're we're, we're moving towards becoming an anti-racist colleague, um, college, um, but you know, it's scary. 
it's scary for people and um, bec because I think as soon as you try to advance equality for one group, people feel like they're losing ground. Another group will feel like that. So one group steps forward and another has to kind of step back and that, and, and, and that feels scary and threatening. And it's, so it's it, that's that's difficult and I'm rambling now. So I'm going to stop. So <laughs> this, is a, this is a floor of mine. I don't know when to stop. There we go. Mark. There we go. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the barriers still exist and I think Sam is quite right. You know, further education is is a challenging sector to work in, like many sectors. Um, and, and there are always other priorities and, it, and it's about really take, making that cultural shift, isn't it? And that takes time and effort and it's that continued effort to make sure that, that really everything we do is underpinned by, by that, that in, sort of that, that, that oversight of an, an inclusive environment really, to make sure that everybody feels part of what we're doing, they feel that they belong. And, and I think sometimes staff find that a little bit more challenging from a perspective of oh, I've got all of this to do and now you're asking me to think of this. And, and you know, in some areas we're still not quite there where actually it's naturally embedded and that, that's still work that we're doing. Um, and I think really from a point of view of the, the reason we changed a lot of the training to, to much more discussion forums uh, was really that, that I think staff felt that they, they sort of attended training, looked at what they were doing, took, took things away and never did anything with it. Um, you know, so, so actually that being part of that discussion and that sharing of people's experience experiences actually has had a really strong impact on people and it's making them sit up much more now and think about right I need to do something about this what am I going to take away um, so so the challenges are still there um, but we will continue to battle on won't we and what about from your point of view Shami Mara because it's a different perspective that you're coming in and I suppose a different range of people that you're dealing with what, what's been your experience from from this perspective yeah so really just echoing what Sue and Sam have already said but I think one one thing that really stood out to me as a barrier was there's a there's you know I work with curriculum staff a lot on a daily basis and there's um, a bit of apprehension and fear around terminology and words and you know as I was leaving the building the other day um, a colleague who I've known a really long time said to me and I, I was with my manager oh see you later ladies oh can I say ladies and you know he, 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 he laughed about it but I love that he then thought about that after he said it because you know you know I'm all for thinking about how, how people identify and for now it was a laugh and a joke but I know that colleague and I know that for a couple of years ago that wouldn't even have even crossed his mind. So the barriers are sort of, I think, people being so apprehensive about what we can and can't say, what terms we can and can't use. But I can I genuinely see that slowly these barriers are being overcome. And that's through consistency. And I will proudly say our positivity um, and always just being willing to, to answer questions and be open to talking about things that are around diversity and inclusion and all sorts of marginalized groups the more we are happy to talk about various things then the less of a uh, like a secret it is it's, it's just like let's just talk about it. let's bring it out. and it's not hush hush if you know what I mean no absolutely and I, I think that that culture of openness and transparency but also not being afraid of what the unknown brings I think that's part of the fear as well like you were saying you know fear of that change it's actually the fear of the change rather than what you're changing to necessarily is is sometimes the challenge and in that and I know you touched on it within the within the presentation that tone from the top piece in terms of having that senior leadership buy-in or, or not having that buy-in how important has that element been in terms of get, kick starting some of the work that, that's been really needed so whether it's that carving out time because that, yeah. that has an impact on other things um, yeah. how have you approached that aspect of it to get those people on board with that decision making process so that you can do the things that you want to do. Um, mm. Probably over to you Sue if you want to start off. 
Yeah, I think that there's there's a very clear message from the from uh, the senior leadership team, the executive team, and the governors as well. In actual fact, um, you know these conversations happen at at uh, corporation. Um, I'm I'm sort of part of the the quality standards committee with our governors. We look at uh, you know d- differences in outcomes between different ethnicities, genders, uh, you know sexuality. Um, so so all the key characteristics um, and they are conversations around what we're going to do and how we're going to move forward. So those actions therefore are supported by the governors, they're supported by the senior leadership team and the exec team and they're driven by them but in actual fact as well there is a key element in making sure that our staff have that 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 voice as well and they are part of that, that decision making along with our students and I think that's been a real focus more recently as well making looking at how we can involve our students much more as well but we need to continue that drive and I suppose it's little things isn't it we don't like to use the word mandatory training we use essential (laughs) Um, but in actual fact it's you know is making sure that that everybody sees the value in in everything that we do so that we can drive towards that ultimate goal of of being a really inclusive college and an anti-racist college which which is obviously what we're working on now with the FE Black Leadership Group. It does come down to personalities well I I was at another large further education college and 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 um you know, it, it, it was a surprise to me when I came to BMET how um, how on board the the current the the principal then was with this agenda, and actually it was heartfelt, and he, and they wanted to do the right thing, and that is my um, um, perception of all of our senior leadership team and our governors. That's truly enabled us to to make the change and make it in a in a really meaningful way so it's it's not a tokenistic or we're just or not just about us um, being um uh, compliant with the public sector quality duty you know that this is because they they mean it which mm. it which is lovely no absolutely anything you want to add to that shimamara just agreeing with that about the importance of the tone from from the top and as as someone i've, I've got uh, many leaders above me but anytime one of my managers makes an effort to um, call me by my full name even and coming from from a leader and a manager it makes me feel so valued and the value that I feel is then what carries on and it that the tone from the top is absolutely important I couldn't agree with more. Thank you. Um, what I was going to say was is that the language and I, and I said this last week is that the language of some of our decision makers in fact a lot of our decision makers is based around evidence and around data and around all these different how have you tackled that whole piece around providing um, the right language so people can understand what decisions need to be made and also what impact they're making um, once they've made those decisions. So how have you tackled the whole thing about the whole evidence and the whole data piece to provide that level of, I suppose, insight into what you're doing and why you're doing it and then the impact of that work? Gosh, that's a challenging question. <laughs> <laughs> For me, do you know what? I, I um, We do a lot of data. Hmm. I, and I can spend a lot of time looking at data. What has become really lovely, so when I joined the organisation four years ago, it was me doing the data, OK? So I was looking at themes and trends that were happening in achievement and retention and satisfaction, and I was looking at complaints and, you know, disciplinaries. Was there any disproportionate impact? And I do so much less of that now because managers are taking responsibility even even teachers you know they 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 they've got sight of their unri- at risk students and they are applying interventions quite quickly so data has become really important i mean i do all the ethnicity pay gap reports and the gender pay still do a lot of data but you know what i i want to move away from talking about data because this is you know this is this is obviously it's important and it's important because you can i don't want to say bash people over the head with it but actually you could it, it, it's got it gives you that evidence base look here there's something going on with our lgb learners here you know they're not achieving as well they're not as happy what's going on and you can start to unpick that it is the start it's the start then of a conversation and i like to employ much more of my time in the conversation now 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I was quite, I was quite um, specific when I said evidence and data uh, in terms of the two different things for me, because uh, one of the conversations that we're having is is that what what qualifies as evidence of the work that you're doing and the reasons behind it, and is whether it's just that new numeric quantitative based data, or whether it's the qualitative data in terms of the stories that you're talking about, the anecdotal. Which was sometimes, which are sometimes disregarded in terms of yeah. have have they elevated in terms of their value in terms of how they're considered in decision making. I mean that, that's why I was very specific in terms of evidence and data as two separate things because yeah. data is one thing. Absolutely, you're right. The data has a purpose, but it doesn't solve problems. Is what you do with that information, but also how else do you gather information and capture the picture that's in front of you? And then how do you make judgments on that? And how do you move forward from that? So that, that's why I was really sort of like trying to eke out of you. And I think you've kind of answered it, which is good. We need to start perhaps having, do you think there's a conversation to have around um, revaluing what we value? in terms oh, of evidence absolutely absolutely and 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 um you know what what we're really trying to work on is is how we hear that the quietest voices here who often get hidden in that in that data and i know ne i never get in, i never forget getting really upset that you know you pick something up in your data and 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 people will say oh yeah but you know it's a really small sample size and i'm like yeah but that that's still five people, right? And they're having not such a good experience and, and we need to get to that. I was Can gonna we... say, it's funny, isn't it? Because um, I've just last week and the week before we were we were validating all the self-assessment reports, which is, you know, qualitative and quantitative data. But the conversations we had around the, the you know, the, the sort of the, the areas where they needed to, to look at from a point of view of achievement rates and that sort of thing, they were conversations around even one student in your area we need to find out if, if there's any patterns going on and how those students are settling in now and have those conversations with those students and look for those indicators as well. So, so making it a much more personal approach from a, a student perspective as well, because ultimately, unless you talk to those students and unless you involve them and, and, and make them feel like that, you know, they feel safe enough to open up, you're never going to be able to, to sort of help support them and retain them as effectively as you really want to and we gave an example in the presentation and and i was absolutely thrilled to bits with this that one of our areas this year that that has got a, a majority black asian and ethnic um, mix of students and, and the staff are a similar mix that they're, they're achievement rates were 97 percent overall this year and they had a level one course where they had 100% retention and 100% pass rate. And, and you talk to them about how they'd done that. And it was really about that really inclusive environment, getting to know their students, creating that really safe environment for those students in a very difficult and challenging year, actually, for many of those students. Mm. And, and I just think that, that we've really got, a, you know, an area there that, that can share that practice across the board and really tell their stories and, and, and share them with staff. And, and I know that staff will respond to that as well. So, so it is those conversations and, and some another piece of work that we've done around, but it is data driven, so I don't know who else I dare say. <laughs> but but we, we've analysed quite a lot of data from, you know, looking at intersectionality from a perspective of, of sort of uh, areas of disadvantage, ethnicity, gender and the key characteristics and, and then just seeing if there were any patterns forming and those patterns we then prioritise students coming in that fit into the, to those different sections. We've not shared that with the teams, but what we've done is put them into a priority report. So if, if one of those students sort of their attendance drops on, say, maths or English or something like that, they go to the top and the weekly report is sent out to say, have a one to one with this student. So actually the teacher knows that it's around attendance, but actually we've looked at that pattern of indicators. Um, so, so it's not around sort of stereotyping people. It's around that positive action to make 
make sure that we can identify where we need to put early intervention strategies in. And that last year worked really well and, and we're building on that again this year. Yes, absolutely. Uh, just a couple of comments coming in. I just, um, mm -hmm. uh, Annie's just, well, not questions, comments. Um, questions, observations, talking and seeing to understand and supporting their, so this is now talking about staff yeah. members too, in terms of that approach towards staff, in terms of that quality of approach, because ultimately, as Annie said, supporting their individual experience is much more impactful. This then has impact, this impacts student experience too. So in terms of, just, just on that, in terms of balance of the work yeah. that you do, not yeah. that you can measure it in that way, but if, if you had to put a percentage on, um, how much of your work goes towards looking at the staff experience versus the student experience? What, where would you say the balance is in terms of the work that you're doing now or work that you have been doing? Where, where has been your focus? Uh, and, and, and is that it, it, shall I answer that? I mean, honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for me, I think, you know, speaking to the point that I made before about actually feeling like I can, I'm handing over the student experience stuff. And actually, I am a member of my role is part of the HR team. So um, at the last year has very much been mm. about staff experience and uh, I'm, I'm driving the staff wellbeing engagement. Uh, strategy as well as you know an extension of our diversity and inclusion work so percentage wise for me um i think i've really i've probably really switched i'm probably doing 80 percent staff inclusion at the moment and that's because i've started to obviously there's a big piece of staff development which supports the student experience as well so so probably 80 percent for me you're do, do you see that changing sam do, do you I see, see that, that change? Do you think that changing as we move forward out of what the last 18 months, what that brought us? I, I don't know. I, I just see as we get an increasingly confident workforce that is really, you know, developing their inclusive practice. I can imagine. I mean, ultimately, you know, I, I should be made redundant because, you know, you, you don't need like we do not have an EDI committee. And if you look, if you think about it, why do we need a designate person here? I'll keep one eye on the law and look out for legal challenges and, and things like that. But, um, oh, do I see it changing? Who knows what's coming around the corner, I guess. Mm. Um, there's a whole big piece of work, isn't there, with the changing, like, you know, I mean, terrible news around the BTEC, dropping BTECs and all of the, you know, adverse impact that that will have on students and what that will mean in terms of curriculum provision. And um, I don't know. What about you? Um, my role obviously is around teaching, learning, quality improvement. So, so a lot of what we do is around more around the students from that perspective. But I also oversee staff development and professional development we work very closely with sam around professional development as well so so i would probably say that my split is probably 70 30 so 30 percent staff and 70 percent students just because of um, you know it's, it's about making sure that we we continue to drive quality improvements for the student experience but very mindful of staff well-being uh, very mindful of, of making sure that that you know we support inclusive practice across the board and it underpins everything that we do so so you know when we change policies and write policies we need to make sure you know look at the impact that that is going to have on on you know specific groups of, of staff as well as students um, you know which is which is general practice isn't it and it's what we should be doing but it, it's just really in, in any of our quality um, activity making sure we're, we're very mindful of that as well and we also all have um, an equality and diversity challenge don't we every year every team has had a, a diversity and inclusion challenge haven't they but the this year they've they've actually got specific performance development objectives so really trying to build that organizational capacity um i do wonder with our work that we're doing around anti-racism and becoming yeah. an anti-racist college if that will shift the balance some of that is about staff um some of the things that we're picking up is around a recruitment of staff and obviously you know big piece of work around um increasing represent i mean you know two white women here as managers, you know, we, we, we have an underrepresentation of of uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic uh, leaders and managers in the college. So, you know, the, there's still a big piece of work around that. Mm. 
Don't know. <laughs> Absolutely what the future will hold. And, and I suppose it's one of those things as you uh, start pulling that thread, you actually don't know where it's going to lead to quite often. Um, I am mindful of the time and I want to give you time to think about, um, I'm going to come to you, Shumimara, uh, in terms of just one final question. But uh, if you can start thinking about people that are starting this journey, what what actions would you want them to take or what points would you want them to take away? If you can pick out one or two points that you think that actually somebody who's, start, who's starting this journey in another college who might see this at a later date in terms of what advice would you give them? Um, a golden nugget as a gift. But I just want to come to you, Shamamara, uh, in terms of um, just that whole point about um, the perception. So you've said you, you've said that you have many leaders above you, you said, <laughs> um, but from the point of view of your experience and how you've, uh, how you how, how have you seen the culture develop as the work has been going through? Because obviously you have um, more of a feel for what's going on within the organisation. And, and how do you think your prospects have changed or not changed as this work has happened, uh, just from your personal perspective? Um, one thing that has, once stands out to me so much is that five years ago I wouldn't have imagined that I'd have the opportunity to deliver an open forum training informative session like I have um, Arnold I was the one who did an informative session or to celebrate the 50th independence of Bangladesh and I was given like free reign to do that it was it was quite just a casual piece quite informal um educational and informative and uh, i came on screen with with my with my traditional clothes and everything but just having that opportunity to do that and and i really don't think i've been i've been with bmet for nine years like not even five years ago a couple of years ago i'd say five i wouldn't even think that that would ever happen and it's that having the chance and having the voice, and I know, I can confidently say, I have a voice to talk about the things that I want to talk about. I have a session next week about being a Muslim woman in the in the Western world. I have a session coming up in February about, about my language. It's International Mother Language Day. And no one holds me back, and I get so much support and encouragement, and I, I can't fault it. I have an EDI challenge though for you. Uh, for the, you know, you, you said that you have an annual EDI challenge. Next year, I want to do a session where you're actually leading and you're actually in in, in a position of leadership within BMET because you can't be that there for that many years and not be in that position. So I think there, there's a good challenge. How do we get? How do we get her up to that level? Um, um, <laughs> that, that would be a good action. That's a good actionable step. So to work on in terms of, I want to come to you as the lead for this all this work. For BMET, by by Sam. Um. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm ready to hang up my hat. I'm ready. Hand it over. So, so okay. So, um, as I said, just mindful of the time. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, just just while you're just getting your thoughts together about what you want to say uh, in terms of advice, I just want to remind um, the people um, that are watching this. Uh, who watches subsequently there are last week we had NK College and their strategic plan next week we've got um, someone who's just won the president's award at AOC which is Alicia Soans who'll be looking at uh, how uh, black history was embedded um, as a 365 day approach within West Suffolk College and then the week after that we've got Jasper Daliwal from uh, Westminster Adult Education uh, Services um, uh, who'll be looking at how they use student uh, attainment gaps to actually drive some of this work. So that very data-driven approach, but th that's the thread that they decided that they were gonna pull that led on to so many more conversations regarding the work around EDI. So another two very different approaches coming in the next couple of weeks. Over to you, Sue. Let's go with you, Sue, in terms of something that you uh, would want somebody to walk away with, some, some good golden nuggets or a golden nugget. I think you I mean from from my perspective we need to make sure is that everybody's on board board involve everybody in those discussions really when you're starting this strategy have a, a really clear aim know what what you want to gain out of it um, and don't be scared of making mistakes and stopping and reviewing and then changing and doing something differently um, because you know not everything does work um, and actually mm -hmm. having the ability to say actually that didn't work right come on let's let's come back together and let's decide how we want to move forward with that I think is 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 key yeah. thank you Sam oh do you know my my piece of advice here is 
try and always be kind. Um, try and always be kind. You will come across people who find it difficult, who may have quite different perspectives to you um, and feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Mm. Uh, but actually, you know, we we need to understand everyone's experience and where they're coming from to be able to to, to truly get people on board with us and, and, and bring everyone along with us. Um, so never take a punitive approach. Always, you know, listen and hear and, and, and be kind and tenacious. Never give up. <laughs> That's what <laughs> one of your colleagues last week oh, I've said don't be afraid to be like a broken record and and, yeah. and that's certainly how I, I feel um uh, be tenacious um and don't be afraid to be and try and have a bit of fun bring a bit of joy because this is hard stuff it's hard stuff and it can feel exhausting put some joy in there as well thank you for that Sam do you want me to read out yours uh, Shimimara <laughs> I'm sure you can say it yourself. <laughs> Just that really, um, you, your your staff and your students can share the most real examples of, of various things. And you don't always have to get your, you know, guest speaker and take that out of your budget. You've got someone sitting right next to you who will be more than happy to talk about what it's like to be on the spectrum or to be trans if they want to talk about that or whatever it is the, the resources are there you've just got to be create the atmosphere and culture where people know they are comfortable enough to talk about things thank you and i think that that that, that i think is the perfect end to this session you have it all there in front of you you just need to tap into that thank you so much i want to thank each and uh, every one of you for taking the time one to put that presentation together i've watched it so many times already and um for giving up your time today as well but as i said last week these conversations aren't a one hit that's it this is about a springboard for further conversations either uh, internally within our colleges or between colleges as well i know that i've already tapped you up sam in terms of um linking you up with ali and annie within the college to have uh, those broader conversations around certain aspects of the work that you're doing but i think that collaborative approach that and as i think jeff said there are lots of things on which the sector can build on and sharing that information i think is absolutely key which is what this is all about this is all about not about ownership this is about how we share that that good practice so that we're not alone secondly we have support and thirdly uh, we have someone to fall back on to support us when we need that within internally and externally as well so thank you and a massive thank you to the people that have attended and the people that do watch online here's to next week where we see alicia Sones talking about black history as a, a 365 day approach thank you very much see you next week thanks very much everybody thank, thank you, you. Bye.